As some of you may already know, I hold the analog series Greylock as one of my favorite horror pieces the internet has to offer, so it's no surprise that when the new tape got released that I would be here to do a video on it. I don't think I am exaggerating when I say that the standard for analog horror has been raised to quite a high amount given the amount of quality and dedication that goes into this series. I'm pretty sure a big YouTuber is behind it if I'm not mistaken, so that might be why the production is just so damn good. If you are unfamiliar with the series, I highly recommend giving it a watch before going further into this video because you probably won't understand what's going on. I do also have a video that I posted last November that covers the first 11 entries in the series. I normally like to wait for a multitude of new episodes before making a video, but this one just seemed to have enough incredible content to cover to fill up a whole session. So without any hesitation, let's walk back through the doors of Mount Greylock and see what horrors await us. But before I let you get too far, I just wanted to say a huge, huge thank you to everyone who subscribed and got us to 100,000. I will be making an official video in the near future about some exciting things we want to announce moving forward, but for right now, there's no specific word that could amount to how grateful I am for the support you have all been giving. I feel like a new word would need to be created to properly convey that feeling. But as always, if you're new here and enjoy what you've been watching, I'll have social links down below, and be sure to hit all those neat buttons as well. Tape 12. Waking Your Subconscious. Right away, I had remembered that the video we were watching in Tape 3 was labeled as TF1, and at the end of that tape, we are instructed to put in TF2, the cassette labeled Waking Your Subconscious. So right off the bat, this was an entry that had been foreshadowed since the very beginning, and I am all here for it. The person who this tape has been assigned to reads Charlotte Jean Melgren. Now that name probably doesn't sound very familiar, but does the name Jim Melgren ring a bell? Jim Melgren was the former police officer turned private investigator who throughout the series appears to be going around investigating the mysteries surrounding Mount Greylock. It's not hard to imagine why, considering that right before the day of the 49 simultaneous home invasions, the contracted construction lead Paul Morelli had him and his entire crew turned sick and ravenous after discovering secret tunnels in the mountain they were making preparations for. Charlotte Melgren is likely to be his wife, or perhaps his daughter? It isn't too clear yet. What's also interesting is the fact that TF1 was assigned to Alexander Marsh, who was the lover of Tiffany, the lady whose baby vanished from her stomach. I apologize if this is a hammer load of information, but this is just a precaution to try and help everyone get caught back up to speed. My question here would be if Alex ever put in TF2, or if Charlotte ever did TF1. I imagine they did, but all off screen. As TF2 begins, we are informed that participation in this part of the system may result in the viewer achieving a heightened sensory state. At this very moment, I can't tell if that's a good thing or a bad thing. I would also like to point out that these side effects don't help ease any tension I may have had beforehand. It also seems to appear that there has been an advancement in technology. It seemed like in TF1, the participants would have to go in this separate Unit 13 to hook up to this big clunky thought form manifester machine. However, in this instance, it appears that Charlotte only needs this Thoughtform VR headset and a way to write things down. As the tape continues on, we are then made aware of a checklist that also needs to be followed to ensure that there are no negative, unwanted side effects. Are these different from the ones mentioned earlier? The rules seem pretty simple. Staying alone, keeping all lights off except for the monitor you're using. The voice does also mention that the reason for keeping the lights off is so you become more frightened which is a good thing in the eyes of this test. It's even suggested that this whole thing gets done after hours. It's also said to keep the volume loud so that no background sounds can distract us. And then finally to keep our workbook on hand and be ready to write stuff down. The most important rule of all is to make sure that everything cable-wise is connected properly as disruptions are not good. It's also told to us that we will be unable to pause or play back any footage after this moment. In fact, any disruption would, well, Let's let them say what it will do. Pausing after this point will cause a disruption, which could carbonite your fucking skull. Interrupt the data being collected by your headset. Now, if I heard correctly, it said that it would pulverize our fucking skull. Just a little side effect, I guess. No turning back now, however, as the countdown has begun, and in 10 seconds, we will be in the thick of it. Our first section is called Induction, for unlocking the gateway to the deeper corridors of your psyche. Thankfully, the tape has a warning for photosensitivity, but I am going to double down on that warning and say that most of you 
We'll probably want to skip until this point because even I very quickly got a headache due to the visual, so even the slightest amount of photosensitivity, I recommend skipping ahead. But for those crazy people, let's see what they have to offer. We are instructed to stare at this mind-melting flashing red screen for 30 seconds. Beginning induction. Please stare at your screen for 30 seconds. Section 2 is called Priming, for preparing your mind for enhanced neuroplastic realignment. I can't be the only one who is noticing the creepy Babadook looking ghosts chilling in the background. This segment is a little interesting. We will get presented with five different sets of words. Each set contains six other words. Out of the six words, one doesn't match with the rest, and it's up to us to figure it out. Get out your pen and papers, ladies and gentlemen. It's homework time. For set one, I would say that out of all these, rope is probably the weird one here. Set two is a bit more tricky. I could be silly, but I would say blood is the outlier here. It's the only thing that isn't an organ. Before we are shown the actual set three, we are flashed the words, all you cherish will be remade. We get a quick flash of this lady with two of her dogs before we get a frame of a newspaper clipping telling us about how a local Samaritan opens her heart and home to stray dogs. After all that, we are shown set three. Also, our Babadook friend appears to be getting closer as we progress further. I would say out of this third set, followed would be the outlier. If it isn't followed, it's probably then visible, but this one had me stumped for a second. Just like last time, we are interrupted before getting to set four, with words that read out, love contorts her flesh and bone. The outlier for set four, I'd say would obviously be improved. Just when you think we will get all the words for set five uninterrupted, we get flashed with words telling us, where is your precious daughter, Jim? Before then getting flashed a missing poster for Charlotte Melgren. Uh-oh. If Jim had been so involved in investigating the strange occurrences surrounding Mount Greylock, and if Melgren was the one hacking into all of these Simeodyne computers at the beginning of the whole series, then I question how he would allow his daughter to wind up going so far as to take part in one of their experiments. Perhaps they aren't as close as we think, or Jim is just completely unaware. Anyways, out of set 5, I would say you is the outlier. At least I hope it is. After our priming has been completed, we get a very quick flash of camera footage taken by Paul Morelli, going through the tunnels he had reported about, before we get a big red warning message telling us that unauthorized alterations had been detected. It's said to stop the playback immediately, and that failure to do so will result in undesired consequences. But previously, we were warned that stopping the playback in any way after a certain point would result in undesired consequences. This doesn't sound good at all for our user. It doesn't seem like we do stop the playback, however, as we end up making it to section 3, conditioning, which is said to be used for testing the way that you perceive and respond to certain stimuli. This is said to be a specialized form of the Stroop test. Now, for those of you who are unaware as to what the Stroop test is, it's when you are given the task to say the word of the color. However, the color of the word doesn't match what it says. So like the text saying red would be in the color blue, but you gotta say red. Same with the other way around, trying to say the color of the text. It's a little brain exercise that I remember doing in like first grade. The twist in this version of the Stroop test is that we need to say the word of the facial expression that is put over a face with said matching expression. However, at some point it will be mixed around, the word happy on an angry face. Should be easy enough. Well, it was easy until we were presented with this facial expression that I have never seen someone do in my life. And if I did, I'd be pretty upset. After that part, we then have to ignore what the word says and just say what the facial expression is converting. I gotta be honest, I had a little bit of a tougher time with this one than with the colors. At some point, very quickly, the facial expressions start to contort and go all sporadic before we are presented with changed and this horrific sequence. The segment we are shown after completely blew me away. We cut into ever-vigil security monitoring footage, and if I had to guess based on the fact Unit 2 is labeled Kennels, we are at some kind of dog shelter. 
The camera starts to glitch out, and the second view we get cuts to show us something quite horrific. This long-limbed, skinless-looking figure had broken in through the door, alerting the security system. The door slams back shut, and the dogs inside are going apeshit. However, the power in the unit completely shuts off, and the dogs go silent. We cut back to the computer of the security monitoring company, where it appears we are in the eyes of the security worker calling our property owner to make sure everything is okay. The person who owns the property? Charlotte Melgren. She picks up the phone after almost a minute of ringing and appears to have been woken up by the call. Our employee Troy introduces himself and calls to inform Charlotte that they have detected unusual activity in the kennel area. Charlotte informs Troy that her dad is the one who set up all the security, so she wouldn't really know what to do in this instance. She also has quite the complaint to take up with Troy as well. Okay, okay so I'm not the one who got the security system, it was my dad. So I don't know if there's some way to fix this or whatever, but you guys have called me in the middle of the night like five times in the past couple of weeks, and it's all turned out to be false alarms, every time. I, I'm so sorry about that, ma'am. I... Troy seems to take into account the fact that Charlotte has had issues of frequent false alarms in the past, but still wants to make sure she is safe in this present moment. After Charlotte reassures him that nothing really appears to be wrong, Troy still recommends that he send an officer out to check out the power outage. I don't blame him because it clearly looked like the door to the kennel area swung open and then slammed shut. Even if you didn't see the giant creature, it should still be a cause for concern. However, Charlotte reasonably has had to deal with this sort of thing on prior occasions, so it would make sense she would just assume this one to be no different. She even mentions the fact that if someone was actually in her room, the dogs would be barking like crazy, and that just isn't happening. Charlotte, who is destined to not have the police show up, comes to a compromise with Troy that she will keep him on the phone as she goes and checks things out. If something goes wrong, he can call the cops. Troy is incredibly reluctant, but eventually gives in and tells her that he is going to double check the footage before she goes out. When he tries to pull up the door alarm footage, it keeps immediately closing out and giving him a playback error. He says that since the motion alarm didn't get triggered, then it's likely fine for her to check it out. As she goes and gets ready to investigate, Troy goes through the previous false alarms to see what happened there. When he checks the door alarm for August 9th, we see once again the door fly open, and then eventually shut. When Troy tries opening up the footage for the 10th and the 13th, the file comes up as corrupted. However, when he opens up the footage for the 16th, we'll see if you can catch what looks very wrong here. Still there? Um, yes. Yes, ma'am. Okay, uh, heading outside now and then going right across to the kennel, so just hang on another sec. For some unknown reason, even after looking at the footage on the 18th, Troy lets Charlotte go all the way into the dangerous area before letting her know what he saw on the footage. He informs her that all the previous false alarms were actually not false alarms. Troy finally tells her that he saw something wrong. He criticizes the other security workers for not noticing this and calling them false alarms. But you, Troy, waited until the very last possible second to warn Charlotte that she shouldn't be out. Luckily, that is enough to get Charlotte to hustle up and get the hell out. She quickly checks on the dogs, and then plans to book it. Except, something is off with the dogs. Charlotte tells Troy that the dogs are just not moving. Not as if they are dead or sleeping, but sitting right up and staring senselessly. However, it appears Troy is able to tap into live footage just in time to see her menacing creature make his way back inside with her. Hi babies. Hi mama. It's... Um... What's wrong? Um, I don't know. Uh, but let's just no, get you back. No, it's not it. They're just standing here, not moving. Like, at all. Like, not even their eyes. It's, it's like, oh my God, it's, it's like they're fucking dead, oh, but they're fuck. not. What the fuck? What? What? Miss Melgren, you need to get out of there and return to your house I immediately. I'm sending your information to the police right now. What's going on? He calls the police and yells at her to get out. The creature separates Charlotte from her flashlight, and she is left unable to see. We get notice that an officer is on his way with an ETA of three minutes. The stakes are high on this one, and the intensity is real. Once again, like straight out of Skinnamarink, the door out has vanished, according to Charlotte. She runs around trying to find a window, but when we look at the cameras, Charlotte's observation is absolutely correct, and her door is in fact missing. 
We are then met with a very frightening audio interaction between Charlotte and the creature. In a flash, the door reappears into existence. However, it appears to be locked. She is continually saying that it is just too dark, so dark that she is questioning if she has lost her sight. Troy tries to reassure her that it's possible that the creature is just as stumbled by the dark as she is. Troy goes silent and informs Charlotte to do the same, with the officer just around the corner. Charlotte doesn't get the memo to keep shut as she talks for a little bit longer. She finally quiets down, but it sounds like the creature is right up next to her before Charlotte utters these terrifying words. I think my skin is moving. It doesn't sound like things ended very well for Charlotte, as her screams fade away and we cut right back to our TF test. Before we go further into this entry, that segment was absolutely excellent. The voice acting was top notch, especially Charlotte, like that sounded really real. And the visuals too, the creature crawling over the roof looks so well done. If Greylock didn't raise the bar before, it certainly did now. But progressing further into the TF2 tape, we are given a true or false questionnaire. The first statement is, this video system is physically changing your brain. I would hope it to be false, but it turns out to be true. Statement two, only a very small percentage of people will never betray their moral values, no matter the situation. I unfortunately reluctantly agreed that it was false. The reasoning given to us is that anyone can be made to betray even the strongest attachments given the right torture or brainwashing. Sick stuff, but I mean, it's the brain. Statement three, through your conscious mind, you make your own decisions. I want this to be true, but according to the test, it is false. They say that the human decision making mostly occurs at an unconscious level and that our conscious mind rationalizes these decisions after the fact, therefore making choice an illusion. Man, this is really making my brain hurt. Statement 4. We all have immoral thoughts and desires, but it's critical to focus our energy on the positive aspects of ourselves so that we can be better people. Absolutely true, oh, I guess not. According to the test, each of us has this shadow entity. It sounds like it's all the darkest aspects of our mind personified as this malleable separate entity. And it's said trying to dampen or subdue it only has an opposite effect, making the entity stronger, darker, and more dangerous. Statement five says opening the door to your shadow psyche and embracing your darkest urge as a part of yourself is the only way to live a fulfilling life. I'm a little unsure about that one, Chief, but if you say it's true, I suppose it's true. However, we get a kind of creepy explanation for this one. Testing complete. I also just want to point out that the Babadook is as close as can be, and I hope he fucks off relatively soon. But as of now, our testing seems to be complete, yet we still have a section 5, called Activation. Establishing the Subliminal Bridge. This is said to have combined all the previous exercises and will create a connection point between our conscious and unconscious mind. It is also said to not look away or shield our eyes for any reason. See, if you tell me not to look away, you're telling me that I am more than likely going to see something that will make me want to turn away. It's a dirty trick, yet it works very well. Like the previous photosensitivity warning, this gets a little flashy, but nowhere near as flashy as the other one. I wasn't really able to discern most of these subliminal messages, really only this first disfigured face before we hold long on this weird guy looking directly into our soul. The next one that got me pretty good was this one here, where you're in one of the most vulnerable scenarios imaginable. If I'm being honest, this kaleidoscope segment looks like I'm looking up at a glass panel where people are dancing among the top. The message after this might mean more than we think. We are presented with this psychedelic space setting and the last mention of space in this series was the fact that pieces of that rock that hit the Earth that later formed the moon still remain on Earth to this day. Does that have a bigger connection? Not too clear yet. The message that follows has a voice speaking, but it's been heavily slowed down. When brought back to normal speed, it says, But parasites like these, while distressing, are no match for man when he's well organized. 
At this point, the messages have reached an unhinged territory. We are presented with these overlapping faces just making horrifying sounds. <laughs> Following that, we see this creature's eyes chilling in the dark. Do these frames have correlations to events happening in real time? Because this could have to do with Charlotte being hunted by whatever creature was following her. Our last message has us flying through a tunnel, over and over again before it appears we are done with the TF2 tape. Now that the TF2 tape appears to be over, we cut back to the body cam footage of the officer who came to check on Charlotte. He goes through into the basement looking around for her. He calls out frequently, but is met with no answer. He even makes mention that it's very dark for him as well, but we learn very quickly that he isn't alone. Jesus, it's dark in here. The fuck was that? The sound doesn't seem to sway him away, but he eventually comes across a very foul odor coming from further in the dark. As he moves further, he hears more of those frightening groans. I am warning everyone now that the scene he is faced with is probably one of the most graphic and realistic scenes I have ever seen in an analog horror. So graphic content warning, you have been warned. <laughs> Somehow, someway, Charlotte Milgren has been merged with the two dogs she had been sheltering, turning into some creature you would see in The Thing. The officer rightfully turns the other direction and hauls his ass right out of there. The body cam footage cuts back to the very end of the TF2 tapes, instructing us to proceed with the next tape, TF3, The Shadow, Communion, and Assimilation. As of right now, my current theory is that Charlotte Milgren was participating in this TF2 process, to which her trial got interrupted when the security went off and Troy called her. We aren't sure what kind of negative unwanted consequences there are. Little did we know that it seemed that these unwanted consequences referred to brutal and horrific transformation where you merge with the dogs you own. See, I already have this girl and dog combination to keep me up at night, and now I have two. So it appears that these people get selected to partake in these TF tapes. From what I can gather, the individual has to watch all three of these tapes before they can go to Unit 13 and get their thought form manifested and then put away or something. I would argue that this is the process Alex Marsh went through to potentially make a thought form of his now deceased lover Tiffany. Now this would explain why Tiffany was able to shoot out of her casket and why her body seemed all ritualistically carved up after she was dead. But then there is also the case of these really dark shadow entities that supposedly exist inside each of us. Are thought forms also these shadow entities being released from us? I wouldn't bet on that too much considering the instructional video said that we can't do anything about it, but yet these TF tapes seem to rely on that person going so far as to even communicate with this dark spirit inside. I suppose if we think back to the TF1 tape, whenever the voice tried to tell us that these thought forms wouldn't be able to harm anyone, the screen glitches out and goes a bit buggy which probably means they aren't being honest. It's possible the thought form manifester was made so that they could have more control over an entity that previously was more of an accidental creation and then was left unsupervised and caused havoc. If these thought forms are related to these shadow entities within, it would make sense that unchecked, these things go pretty wild and crazy. Now it also appears that this hidden shadow entity can be unlocked and completely take over the person that once was. I believe this could be an explanation for Paul Morelli's crew and their inevitable deformations, but also the abilities that came with it. As of this moment, I believe that there is a singular evil entity that exists beyond this black door the tape wanted us to open earlier, and that door exists in each of us and can be opened and will let this thing go full takeover. The reason I think this is because back in prior entries we see an interview between a very young Tiffany and a doctor, who tries using hypnosis to lure her through her childhood home through her brain, towards an extra black door to which once she goes inside, there is a tall figure that slowly turns towards her. This tall figure could be the same one that Paul Morelli's crew reported seeing in the woods as well, but I gotta be honest, the creature that attacked Charlotte was also pretty tall. I think it's safe to theorize that this tall figure is able to go around and somehow create these abominations. The figure did it to Paul's crew, and they did it to Charlotte and her dogs, 
and Jim Melgren is probably going to be extra on the hunt after he hears about this. Unless, this is the event that sparked his investigation in the first place. Well, ladies and gentlemen, if you made it all the way to the end, I thank you for watching, and be sure to hit all those neat buttons down below if you enjoyed the video, and be sure to hit that subscribe and bell notification so you can be a part of every new upload. But other than that, Greylock certainly raised my expectations for the future entries to come, and I am beyond excited to see what other monstrosities they are going to make me bear witness to next, even if it kills me.